Hi, my name is Ameya Abhyankar. I'm the founder and lead trainer at FinQuest Institute. In this video, we'll do a brief overview of central counterparties. So these are the points which we'll discuss as a part of this video. So let's understand the concept of risk. So risk is defined as an uncertainty in any outcome. To understand risk through a very simple example, assume a scenario whereby I as an investor want to open a fixed deposit with a certain bank. Let's say I have 100 units of cash with me. So I go to my local bank and I park that money for the next one year. Let's say the bank is paying a rate of 5% on that fixed deposit. So in one year's time, I can go to the bank and receive 105 units of currency back. So that is the 5% return which I am getting on this particular transaction. So you can imagine this to be like a risk-free transaction because if we assume that the bank is not going to default, then this is considered as good as a transaction which carries no risk. Now contrast this with a direct equity investment. Imagine I want to invest in the equity markets and I am tracking a certain stock of an XYZ company. So the movements in the stock markets as well as the movements in the individual equity prices are going to impact my portfolio returns. So there is a significant amount of uncertainty which is involved in the transaction. So that's how we can classify two types of investments, one which does not carry a risk whereas other investment which carries market risk. A few common types of risks which we observe in the market, we have market risk. So this is the risk owing to the price fluctuations due to the movements in underlying variables. So depending on what portfolio I am holding, the movements in those particular underlying variables are going to impact my portfolio positions. So imagine that I am holding a plain vanilla bond portfolio. So the movements in the market yields are the risk factors which I am concerned about. So the movements in these risk factors are going to impact my bond portfolio position. So you can call that as a market risk for my portfolio. Next is credit risk. So credit risk is something which we will uh, spend more time in this presentation because when we talk of CCPs, credit risk happens to be the most important portion of risk which we are trying to mitigate. But in a nutshell, uh, credit risk is defined as a risk of default. So more about credit risk when we discuss uh, the next bullet. Coming to operational risk, operational risk can either be an internal risk or be an external risk. So there can be certain internal events like say a rogue trader or maybe failure of my internal systems or there can be external events which are impacting my uh, organization or so something like a cyber attack risk. So all of these get classified under operational risk parallels. Next are legal and compliance risks. So these are a non-quantitative type of risks but they have to do with uh, the, the legal and the regulations which are there in that particular jurisdiction. So in most banks and financial institutions, you have a, a team of lawyers who are there to advise on the best way to manage legal risk for that particular organization. Now focusing on credit risk. So when we say credit risk, we can divide that in uh, three points roughly. So firstly, it's counterparty default. So an example of counterparty default can be, let's say uh, there are two counterparties A and B and they have entered into a derivative transaction. Let's say there is a swap transaction which A and B have entered into. So that means, uh, assuming it's a vanilla swap, A will pay a certain rate of say 5% fixed and it will receive say a floating rate of LIBOR from B. Now this swap will have a specific tenor. Imagine that this swap has a tenor of 2 years and let's say the cash flows are going to be exchanged at the end of every quarter. So uh, at, the, at the contract initiation, both the counterparties ha, uh, are in good financial condition, so no problem at all. Let's say six months down the line, counterparty B starts experiencing financial difficulties. So it's unable to honor its commitments on various contracts. And let's say this contract with party A also happens to be one of that, which uh, party B is unable to uh, abide by the requirements. So in that scenario, party B may either partly default on its payments that means it may default on a few cash flows which it is due to pay to A or it may default completely that let's say from 6 month onwards party B will not be able to make even one single cash flow payment to A. So that's how we can understand uh, in part or full counterparty default risk. So that has to do with credit ratings of companies. 
So whenever there is a drop in credit rating for a company, that means the credit worthiness of that company has come down and that is a credit risk from the market's perspective. Next you have a concentration risk. So concentration risk implies that your portfolio is concentrated or anchored around specific sectors or maybe specific issuers in an industry. So that's what we call as a concentration risk. So there are other items which we study as a part of credit risk as well. So this is not a, a entirely exhaustive list. There are a few more points to it, but we have discussed the ones which are most prominent. Coming to bilateral transactions, majority of the transactions in the OTC market happen on a bilaterally cleared basis. So what do we mean by clearing and settlement? So these are two important portions for any trade cycle. So the trader enters into a transaction. However, unless a trade is cleared and settled, we cannot say that the entire trade cycle has got completed. So what do you mean by clearing of a trade? So clearing of a trade starts from the moment the trade has been entered into right until trade settlement. So any kind of margining, netting and other uh, arrangements which are to be done during that time, that gets classified under the clearing system. Whereas settlement is what happens at trade maturity. So clearing for OTC transactions can be long. So you can have OTC trades which are existing for say the next decade. So, so the clearing process continues right until that time and finally at the 10 year maturity point the settlement of the trade happens. Now understanding properties of a bilaterally cleared transaction. So that is something which is commonly observed in OTC markets. So OTC transactions are customized. So you can design the product which is tailor made to your requirements. So that's the beauty of OTC because that way specific requirements of clients can be met through customized contracts. The liquidity of OTC market is low because we know that a contract which is tailor made might not be very appealing to a other set of market participants. So liquidity for that product naturally drops. It is comparatively opaque because OTC transactions are done between individual counterparties. So someone who is not privy to that transaction will not have access to that particular contract. So they may not know that such a contract exists. So that introduces some degree of opaqueness in the transactions happening on the OTC space. Price discovery is difficult because naturally if you have a, a contract which has been customized between two counterparties, then there may be very few takers in the market who may be willing to quote uh, any uh, pricing on such a contract. So that way price discovery becomes a challenge. Then there is little or no regulation on the OTC space. So in the OTC markets, especially the bilaterally cleared ones, clearing and settlement becomes an important concern for the trading counterparties. So counterparties will try their best to mitigate the credit risk which is embedded because whenever a transaction is bilaterally settled between two parties, that means there is no one else in that loop. The management of credit risk is completely the onus of these two parties who are transacting. So a few measures which are popularly used. So one of the, so one of the popular measures which market participants use for mitigating this risk in a bilateral transaction is what we call as a CSA or a credit support annex. So CSA is an agreement which a bank will do with its major trading counterparty banks. And the way in which CSA functions is the banks are going to use their respective pricing models to arrive at valuations of their individual portfolios. And depending upon which bank is in the money on that particular day, the other, other bank is going to make a cash payment to that, particular, uh, to that particular counterparty. So that means the collateral exchange is in the form of a cash collateral which will be exchanged at the end of the day. And this collateral exchange happens on a daily basis. So the idea is no matter how stable your counterparty bank is, by doing this daily collateral exchange, you are ensuring that even if a certain too big to fail bank is to go down under uh, overnight, still you are protected against credit losses. And that's the reason why majority of the banks will prefer to do a CSA collateral exchange on a daily basis. So now we know what are bilaterally cleared trades. We also know what are the pitfalls of that particular transaction. So this leads us to the concept of CCPs. So CCPs are what we call as central counterparties or central clearing houses.
So the idea of having a CCP is the process of clearing and settlement. That is something which will be managed by a CCP, which is like an independent third party who will be a part of any transaction between two parties. And how does the CCP accomplish that? So CCP uses a process called as novation. So one common example to depict novation, let's say there are two parties A and B. To understand the concept of novation, uh, we'll study this diagram. So there are two parties A and B. Now assume we are looking at path one. So if it's path one, then A and B are transacting with each other directly. So through path one, there is no presence of CCP in between. So this is what we call as a bilateral trade. So the onus, so as we know, in a bilateral trade, the onus of credit risk management is on the two parties who are transacting. Now see scenario two, whereby we have a CCP in between. So whenever we have a CCP in between, that means that those two parties are going to see CCP as their ultimate counterparty. So through novation, CCP becomes a buyer to every seller and a seller to every buyer. And the contracts done via path one and path two are absolutely equivalent to each other. Only difference is we have a CCP in path two, which is there to provide the clearing and settlement services and thereby bring down the credit risk, which is embedded in the transaction. So this is what we call as novation. Now, why we call it as novation? Because we are trying to create something new. So earlier in a bilateral transaction, we had just one trade, which is which we have depicted via path one. Now through novation, we are splitting this trade into two parts or we are novating something. So we have two parts A and B under this particular path, path number two. So that's why the word novation, creating something new. Now CCPs are private organizations. So there is surely a chance that a certain CCP can also default. The chances of that are low, but there is definitely a remote possibility that even a CCP can default on its commitments. So in order to avoid that scenario from happening, CCPs do a certain set of funding arrangements, which ensure that they have ample amount of funding available in case of member defaults. So a few ways in which CCP manages their funding is firstly initial margin. So anytime a, a certain clearing member wishes to enter into a transaction which is cleared by a CCP, then at the time of entering into the trade, a certain initial margin which is specified by the CCP has to be posted by that particular member as a collateral with CCP. So without posting the initial margin, that particular trade cannot flow through a CCP. Next is the variation margin. So very similar in concept to the variation margin which is applied by exchanges on the exchange traded space. So in this, the transacting counterparties are supposed to post variation margins on a day-to-day -day basis. So CCPs have their independent pricing engines through which they will determine how much is the amount of margin or variation margin which is to be posted by any member. And that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Next is default fund. So every member who wishes to be a part of the CCP has to post a certain amount of fund into what we call as a default fund provision which has been created by CCP. So every participating member will be posting a certain amount of funding uh, under this default provisions. Also there is a member equity portion. So whenever a member takes a membership with a CCP, they are purchasing a certain portion of the CCP. And that is what we call as members equity in the CCP. So in case there is a default from a particular member, then the initial margin and variation margin are taken into consideration to see if the required default loss can be met. If not, then the default fund of that particular member will be used up for meeting any kind of credit process which have come in because of the default by that particular member. Subsequently, other measures which a CCP can do to handle any kind of member defaults. First is auctioning off the defaulted trade. So in case of a member default, whichever trade the member has defaulted, CCP will begin auctioning of that trade to other members of the CCP. So those members who wish to take a certain position on that trade can uh, enter into the transaction and that can happen through an auction process. If the trade doesn't get auctioned off, then CCP goes in for loss mutualization. So that means the default fund which has been posted by other members who have not defaulted, 
Now, their default fund will start getting consumed under this loss mutualization approach. So, these are a few techniques by which CCP tries to handle any kind of member defaults. And the idea behind this is CCP is trying to contain any kind of systemic risk which is being generated owing to member defaults. Now, let's focus on the regulatory efforts and their impacts on CCPs. So, post-2008 meltdown, a significant amount of regulations have come in and market has um, begun looking at CCPs as those entities who, are, who may be capable of containing systemic risk as it builds up in the system. So, a few regulatory actions in response to the global financial crisis. Firstly, CCPs uh, should clear vanilla contracts, especially vanilla swaps and CDS contracts. So, the standardized contracts are something which CCP should focus on clearing. Next is OTC transactions which are uh, hosted by CCPs, they have to be submitted to repositories. So, the idea is whenever a transaction is submitted to a repository, that is something which will be accessible to regulators as well. So, that brings a kind of comfort to the regulatory framework because then regulators know exactly what kind of trades are happening on the OTC space. Also, there was a regulation saying that OTC transactions which are done outside the CCP should attract more amount of capital. That is, any bilaterally settled contracts should incur more amount of capital requirements vis-a-vis -vis a similar contract done on a CCP. The way forward for CCPs, so talking of Indian markets, because India being an emerging market and an important portion of the global financial landscape, in India, for OTC transactions, we have CCIL or Clearing Corporation of India Limited, which forms a major CCP for providing clearing and settlement services, especially for fixed income swaps and the FX space. Whereas on regulated exchanges like the National Stock Exchange in India, we have NSCCL, which is there to provide clearing and settlement for transactions which happen on the exchange. So banks are using these type of CCPs to a significant extent. The idea behind that is if a bank can transact on a CCP, that is, the other way to look at it is the bank is doing a trade which is guaranteed by a CCP. So whenever that is the case, the exposure for the bank comes down. So whenever exposure for a certain bank comes down, the capital requirements around the exposure are also reduced. So that frees up capital for the bank, which is very important because any capital which is getting freed up, bank can use that capital for its core business applications. So that's why the effort is to move as many trades as possible onto a CCP to free up capital. And globally as well, we are observing a similar trend. So if we uh, see from 2008, there has been a steady increase in volume of trades which are happening on CCPs. So global CCPs like LCH, ClearNet or EuroClear, etc. They are seeing a significant amount of volume. So market participants are also trying to utilize CCPs in the best way possible in order to mitigate risk and they view CCPs as those entities who would be there to contain any kind of systemic risk if it has to occur in the near future. So this completes our brief discussion on central counterparties. So to know more about such interesting concepts in finance and to stay tuned with our new courses, do visit our website www.finquestinstitute.com. Thank you.